Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlen, Vice President of Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Greg Wilson, who is the CISO at DocuPace. So today, uh, the topic that we're going to talk about is ransomware. And I'm, I'm excited to get a, a CISO's perspective on this topic. I think um, we've obviously seen ransomware in the, the headlines a lot lately. In fact, uh, a lot more lately than in the past. So I, I think a good starting point for us, Greg, is to, to just ask the question, has has something really changed in the market or in the industry that's made ransomware a, a bigger deal today than it has been in the past? Yes, I would say so. Things like this really increase during times of uncertainty. And with COVID recently, uh, you've had a lot of uncertainty. The other thing is you've had a number of people who are working remotely. So normally when you're in a corporate enterprise, there are more security controls in place when you're in a corporate environment. Now people are working from home and oftentimes people will work. um, They won't necessarily log into their network where all of those security controls are. Um, They'll just they won't log VPN into their network. So there are fewer security controls and people more likely to have administrative rights to their machines, which gives uh, greater rights to make changes than they would normally have. So you kind of have a confluence of events that uh, create a ideal time to uh, have ransomware attacks. I hadn't really thought about how ransomware or a rise in ransomware might be tied to the the COVID nineteen pandemic and the the changes that that came with that. That's a an interesting connection to make. Does that mean that that you know the assuming that we at least in some part that people start heading back to the office at some point in the relatively near future? Do you think that's going to precipitate a decrease in in ransomware, or do you think that this is a change that's that's sort of here to stay? I think as long as it is effective, it will continue to, it will continue to continue. Uh, once, uh, it becomes less effective, um, then you'll see it tend to drop off. But I don't think ultimately it will ever go anywhere because it's simply too lucrative. Uh, they'll just change their methods, uh, and they'll become more mature. They'll create better examples, uh, better instances. Ransomware is a, um, it's a it's a challenging problem, and it's also a, a a problem that's that's fairly different from a lot of other types of cybersecurity attacks. Because, of course, ransomware, in order to be successful, has to be detected. It has to announce itself in order to to ask for the ransom. So your your point about as long as it's effective, I think, is a is an important one. Um, it, it, ransomware also seems to present this challenge where, sort of at the at the the collective level, it makes sense. For people to, you know, people often say you shouldn't pay the ransom. It only encourages ransomware to be successful or to continue. But then at the individual level, for an individual organization, of course, it's a different story. If you're in the middle of a ransomware incident and you weren't prepared for it, paying the ransom is the the fastest way to get your business back on track. So when we sort of look at those factors, uh, how do we how do we expect that ransomware might either remain effective or how is it going to become ineffective or ineffective as things change? Well, one is people, there's certain things. So ransomware is largely preventable. You can significantly, significantly, significantly reduce the instances and effectiveness of ransomware by good cyber hygiene and taking, uh, having great backups. Um, people will only do things when it's beneficial to do it. And so once you reduce the payout to people doing it, uh, because it's become uh, commoditized. So it's it's one of those things where most people don't run their own operations. They will go out and they'll buy the malware. They'll pay someone to 
do the uh, to send out the messages. It, it's almost like a service, unlike any other commercial service. It's like email marketing. You you going out hiring a marketing company. People essentially do the same thing for ransomware. And so once it becomes no longer cost effective, then people will no longer do it. You mentioned that it's it's largely preventable through cyber hygiene. Does that mean that um, you don't think a, a, a legislative option like making it illegal to pay ransom is the right path forward, that it's really up to organizations to, to be to implement effective security controls? I'm curious if you have an opinion on that. Yeah. Yes. So to legislate that you will not pay a ransom um, is, I, I would say, misguided. Uh, because you haven't fixed the underlying issue. You haven't corrected the underlying issue. The underlying issue is people are not implementing some of the security controls. They're not making investments in security that they should be making. And ultimately, what I tell organizations is this. Either you can pay up front or you can pay in back. But if you pay on the back side, it's going to come with interest. And so... It's better to pay up front. That perspective on on a you know a legislative solution, it, it would I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it would it might solve the problem of of ransomware in particular because it would no longer be a, a lucrative approach, but it wouldn't resolve the underlying issues with information security that allow ransomware to be effective. So we'd still be vulnerable. We just might not realize it as much because we don't have ransom ransomware asking for ransom all the time. Is that Kind of the interpretation? Did I get that right? Yes. The other challenge is you have, but what about the repercussions to that? So, for example, one of the earlier places where ransomware, and it's still pretty popular, is a hospital system. If you have a person that's going in for surgery and this hospital uh, is infected with malware and their files are encrypted, so now they can't perform this life-saving surgery do you allow people to die or do you pay the ransom? Um, so there are some real life consequences to this. If you're a medical device manufacturer and someone is holding the data uh, and a person is, there's an impending issue that, you know, leads to heart failure or their defibrillator will no longer work because the signal is not being sent. I mean, there are various things where th there could be, non-IT security technical impacts mm -hmm. to this. Uh, you're, you're really grabbing one leg of the stool trying to repair it where the other three are still damaged and you haven't really addressed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I think about the, the CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, availability. Um, and, you know, the, the potential, as, as I've seen talked about in the past, the potential of adding safety to that triad, um, which makes it, I think, a a tetrad or something like that, but that more and more cybersecurity has to account not just for the C, the I, and the A, but also for safety as a as a meaningful objective as well. Um, and you seem to be calling that out. Yes, there. I I think that the I agree with you, and and what it really points to is people have to stop looking at information security as a IT issue, but as a business issue. Uh, when you take a very narrow view of information security, you don't get that holistic view that you really need to have for your organization. If you view it as a business issue, then it starts to encompass some of those other areas that you're mentioning. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com So when we look at how ransomware is treated sort of in the what I would call the the industry press so not you know mainstream press but more sort of you know 
industry press, for folks who are practitioners, it's very often focused on the specific type of malware or the technical details of the ransomware itself. How important do you think it is for information security practitioners to really understand those details in order to defend themselves against ransomware? Well, you have to, if you're infected with ransomware, you have to identify in order to be able to remediate it and remove it and truly be able to return back to business as usual. Uh, probably the best analogy I would give is if you were diagnosed with cancer. If the doc, if your oncologist walked in and said, you have cancer, and you said, what type, what difference does it make? You have cancer. It's going to make proper treatment of that cancer very difficult because all types of cancers are different. And the treatment for those are different. There's different modalities and medications that are more effective than others. The same way with ransomware, uh, depending on the, the original manufacturer of it, uh, mm -hmm. The the type, they're going to leave different what's known as IOCs, indicators of compromise. And once you know what type of ransomware it is, you uh, you will know what indicators of compromise there are. So you can actually locate the payload to be able to remove it. Uh, you can see it, including uh, people who create this. They're all. Uh, creatures of habit, they have a modus operandi. And once you understand who they are, then you know what to look for. And it helps expedite your return to business as usual. So that's a that's a perspe perspective on, on sort of detection and response, which I think is important. Um, but if we're talking about, if we go back to the cyber hygiene question, because you know you had, you had said originally that ransomware is largely preventable with, with cyber hygiene. I want to break that down a little bit and understand what, what that means. So um, when you talk about preventing ransomware, what are the security controls that you're thinking of that you found to be most effective in defending against ransomware prior to, to the infection, right? So if you look at ransomware, largely comes from two or three different vectors. Uh, you have email is probably the most prevalent way that uh, ransomware is delivered. Uh, and the other way is uh, compromised credentials. So someone obtained a person's username or ID or someone giving you or down inputting a file into your network, either via a thumb drive, a what you thought was a valid download, but a piece of software that was compromised. Those are primarily the primary ways that they come in. Um, so things you can do. So if you once you know how things are, how it's delivered, you can then turn around and, and figure out, OK, what's the best ways to address it? So things that we do, you have uh, virus protection when emails are sent. So a every email that comes in, if there's an attachment, uh, you do a a scan of that attachment to make sure that there's not any malware associated with that file. Uh, you have web content filtering. So if they attach a link uh, that they that they want to attempt to get you to select to go out to that link, uh, you want to have a web filtering where it is looking at that destination website, making sure that it has not been compromised. Um, you want anti-malware. Um, on all of your hosts and a host is simply a computer, any piece of equipment so that it eradicates that malware. Uh, you want something to block communication to, you know, you have firewalls and other devices that will block access to compromised, uh, sites. Multi-factor authentication. So if someone does compromise one of your username or password, you have a second factor, i.e. you have something you know, which is your username and password, something you have, your phone, uh, which now is sending a code to it that's saying, hey, enter this code before you log in. If someone steals your username and password, they're not going to have your phone to have to be able to get that code. Uh, it's doing things like that. Uh, patching is another big one because all of these typically work 
on previously identified security patches that for one reason or the, or another, the organization is not applied to their, their network, their application, their infrastructure. So it's doing simple things like that, that will go a long ways to preventing this. And the final thing is good backups, because even if you are compromised and they do come in and they infect your system, if you can go back to a backup and copy to the last known good state, there's not a need to pay that ransom. So in going through those security controls, um, I think you're you're calling out something that isn't always obvious to people when they talk about ransomware, which is that ransomware is a is an attack that has multiple steps, or it's a type of attack that has multiple steps. So, you know, phishing might be the starting point. You know, someone uh, opens an attachment or clicks a link, but that starting point is going to be on one device that probably doesn't have a whole bunch of critical data on it, you know, that's going to prevent the business from running. So how do you get from that initial compromise to, you know, encrypting mission critical, business critical data that that prevents, uh, you know, a hospital from delivering care or a pipeline from delivering oil or things like that? What are the what are the steps in there? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So one of the first things that happen is once they once you're able to ransomware is allowed is able to get into malware is allowed to get in. The very next thing uh, they want to do, well, the first thing they want to do is maintain that access. So they'll create what's known as a backdoor. A backdoor is just a malware that uh, enables remote access and control. Uh, and so they want to do privilege escalation. So you want to get a a user ID that is that has privileged access, which will allow them to create uh, a backdoor, uh, another account or way to get in to that machine. If they're discovered through the their, if you find the malware and get rid of it, they've already created a backdoor where they can get in to get back in. So I want to call out something that you mentioned earlier that I think was an important connection there because you talked about how with COVID-19, you have more people working remotely and you have more people running on their systems with administrative privileges, which means that if they get malware on their system, it doesn't have to go through that process of privilege escalation because it's already on the system with administrative privileges based on the user who installed it. So that's that, correct. That limitation of admin privileges is a, is a key step to, to making it harder, basically. Absolutely. That's, yeah. that's a, um, it would be very, very difficult to do if you could not escalate privilege because then you're limited to potentially that machine or it takes more work, which gives you more time for you yeah. to identify it. You'd have to so, exploit a vulnerability or a misconfiguration to gain to do that privilege escalation. Correct. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So once you come in, once they get access, they've escalated privileges. They want to, next thing they want to do is to try to come in and uh, uh, destroy or encrypt files, even potentially your backups. And so they're going to go around and just start transversing the network and start encrypting. They're going to install encryption uh, key and start encrypting files. Um, and the thing that a lot of people don't understand, this is not necessarily, it doesn't all happen on the same day. Oftentimes, this is happening over a period of weeks. Uh, and by the time that you figure out what's happened, uh, there's, and you heard me mention earlier, IOCs, indicators of compromise, there, there are tentacles all over the place. Mm. Uh, so when you, so all of a sudden, you get this notice, someone will notice, hmm, there are files with this, uh, a weird uh, extension. You know, normally your files in a .doc, you might see OSR, OSIRIS is a, uh, a form of ransomware. So you see these weird extensions and someone will get a notice that says, hey, your files have been encrypted. Uh, pay us uh, 20, 20 bitcoins to get your files back. <clears throat> One of the things that they've recently started doing previously, they would just simply encrypt the files. Now what they're doing is they're exfiltrating that data, copying those those files off to another server, and they will come back and say, well, because most people really wouldn't report that they got hit with ransomware. Uh, 
So now what they're doing to uh, get people to pay it, even if you do your backup, is to say, oh, by the way, we save copies of these files. I'll send you an example of what we have. We're going to publicly uh, disclose this information. So even if you can restore and go back to business as usual, they have your data. And so they will also threaten to publicize that data. Uh, and then from that point, it comes down to, you know, negotiation and arranging for payment if that's a path you choose to take. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So you talked in there about the, uh, you know, the movement from that initially compromised device, those tentacles reaching out into the rest of the organization. Um, and that I think the, the connection I want to draw there is some of the security controls uh, you mentioned are more about preventing or making that, that movement inside your organization more difficult than stopping the initial compromise. You obviously want to stop that initial compromise if you can, but you also want to make the, make it a harder job to compromise more of your environment once one system is infected. And I think that's an important point, that it's not just about preventing that initial uh, infection. It's about making it a harder job to, to get to your sensitive data, right? Correct. The, the analogy that I use is this. It's a person standing there um, and you have a person shooting a thousand arrows at you. You have to be right every time. They only have to be right once because it only takes one person to click a email or a file and download ransomware into your environment and the process begins. And so, um, you know, time and luck is on their side because they only need one mistake and they're in. Mm hmm. So there, there's a lot of these basic controls. Uh, I, I, I tend to call them basic rather than simple because I think simple because I think doing the basics right can be very complicated. Uh, basic controls at, that help with ransomware. But are there? Do you have any examples of of security controls that you think are are least effective in defending against ransomware? Like what doesn't make sense from a ransomware perspective? Controls that doesn't make sense. That's a good question. I've never had anyone pose that question to me that way. Um, things that that doesn't make sense. Uh, I would say, you know, there are companies that if you try to block everything, because when it comes to security, there's always a um, a risk of you're, you're always balancing productivity versus protection. And sometimes I've seen organizations that completely lock down their systems where you can't, uh, employees can't go out to the internet. Uh, they can't access personal emails. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a complete lockdown. Um, and it, and it creates almost like a, a big brother environment. Uh, I have found I've operated in organizations where that were the case. I've operated in environments where the systems were reasonably secured, um, and in the instances of, of ransomware were the same. I think you can go, I've seen people go so heavy on the control standpoint to where, uh, the productivity drops off, uh, the culture is impacted and it ultimately ends up in, um, turnover. Uh, because it just it's not a fun environment to work on. So I think you can go everything you do really needs to be risk based. Many of the controls that you need to to stop to stop or minimize the impact of ransomware is not overly burdensome or intrusive on your user base. I can't help but think about how what you're describing there is a a mismatch in the you know the mission or the perceived risk for that organization versus the 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 depth of those controls or this you know how stringent the controls are because there are situations if you're working in you know a nuclear power plant or uh you know a, an environment where 
it is appropriate to have very strict controls. But then the people working in that environment understand why it makes sense to them. And, you know, the, you run into a problem, as, as you were describing, when it doesn't make sense, when the, 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 you know, how stringent those controls are is a mismatch for the, the level of risk or the environment. Um, and then you end up with those problems of, of turnover or, you know, employee culture. And, and ultimately, I think people find ways around the controls in the Absolutely. end. Absolutely. Well, very interesting conversation. I really appreciated the time. I think, uh, you know, we, we got a few different perspectives on ransomware that maybe haven't been covered elsewhere. Um, and certainly appreciate having a, a CISO's perspective uh, on this episode about ransomware, which is a, a hot topic. So uh, thank you. Greg Wilson for joining us today. Much appreciated. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone who listened to this episode. Uh, I hope it was interesting and educational. It certainly was for me and I enjoyed the conversation. And I hope you'll tune in for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.